So, good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick from the Java User Group, and we have today a very interesting talk about fuzzing with Java or in Java with Jazzer. And Fabian Neumertheim is joining us from Germany. I met him um, probably a year ago or so at the Java Land in Germany. And um, he had this interesting talk, and I said, we need to have him as well at the Swiss Java user group because I think it's quite interesting what he will talk about. So as you know, usually I'm the one doing the administrative things and Fabian will afterwards talk about um, all the other nice and exciting features of Jazzer. So um, I just realized we have to go like, oh, sorry about the slide mess here. So we need to start from the beginning. And um, just to make sure that everyone knows how to work with a big marker, we have on the right side, the chat section, where also already Marcus wrote his hello from Lucerne in there. And you can also write like from where you're joining. So we will see like who joins from which region. Another thing which is quite important is the question and answers. So if you have questions to Fabian, please use the question and answers um, tab because then we can separate the questions from the noise. And everyone can basically upvote the questions. So that means like we will go like through the list of questions from top to down. Um, sometimes like during the talk, if it fits appropriately or in the end. Yes, so that's basically already my part, except like the new events I wanted to introduce you to. Um, we will have now more and more on-site events from the Java user group in Zurich, St. Gallen, Lucerne, Bern, and Basel. And we have already a few exciting things planned as you can see on the slide. But these will not be only um, on-site events. We will also have some online events. So the next online we event we are planning was just like sent out today by Ursula and it's um, from Marco and he will do some live drawing and live um, coding uh, in a special session, which will be also here in Big Marker. And I think that's somewhere around um, mid or towards the end of May. Yes, so that's already it. And um, I would love to like introduce Fabian. I think you will talk a little bit more about yourself just like in a minute or so. And yeah, you will see me at the end of the presentation again to do the question and answers. So the oh. stage is yours. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello from Cologne in Germany. Um, yeah, today I want to introduce you to the concept of fuzzing applied to Java um, and using the, the open source fuzzing tool Jezer that uh, we at Code Intelligence developed and open source roughly about a year ago, a bit more than a year ago. So that lined up pretty well with that original um, talk at Javaland. And uh, I don't assume any um, prior knowledge on fuzzing. And even if you know fuzzing, you may not have fuzzed Java yet. So uh, we'll start slowly and then build up with some hopefully interesting examples and then see some of the capabilities of Jezer and how you can use it to test libraries and applications for, for security issues, functional bugs, all these things. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, just a quick slide about myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Code Intelligence, a German fuzzing startup. I'm a mathematician by education, but I've always been passionate about IT security. Um, I'm also a frequent contributor to open source projects such as Bazel, Chromium, or uh, the Android password store, which has a special place in my heart. And uh, at Code Intelligence, I'm responsible for the development of fuzzing technologies um, with a focus on memory safe languages and uh, web services. And I'm also uh, leading some open source initiatives of which Jezer is the most prominent one and cooperations with other companies on these matters. Um, mostly so for Google, but also um, some research institutes in, in, in Germany and uh, other places. Um, yeah, you can reach me on Twitter and, and get up or just send me an email. Um, yeah, but so let's get started and let's learn about what is fuzzing. 
Um, so if you look this up in a dictionary, it doesn't tell you much, <laughs> unless it's a very special up-to-date dictionary. Um, fuzzing means to make or become blurred. And what it does, or what it did in the past, when this sort of first came up, I think in the 1980s, it was used to stress test some, some Unix system utilities, and it was essentially just what you see on the screen. A fuzzer is a program that subjects a system under test, which can be anything, a library, application, whatever, to random inputs until the thing explodes because the input was too weird. Okay, that, that <laughs> sums it up. It's a bit like monkeys on typewriters, um, not very interesting. But uh, at the time, and I think still, like if you subject tools to random inputs, um, you will find some very interesting questions. But fuzzing has developed over the last 40 years. And what people quickly started to do is to say, okay, random data, that doesn't really get you that far. If you have an image parser and you feed it with random data, then this random data will almost surely not be a very interesting PNG or JPEG. And it won't, won't trigger any interesting functionality. So what you do is that you start with some random image, um, like some part of your unit test, test data, for example, and then you subject it to random mutations. So for example, you flip it or you change the color, something that sort of takes a valid image to a valid image or a semi-valid image by some, some simple procedure. Um, and you can go a step further because, I mean, that, that only takes you so far. Like if you flip images, then likely the flip image will be valid, not find an interesting security issue in your image parser. So you want to do something more fancy. Um, and that's where the concept of white box fuzzing starts. So the idea is that you're the good guy, right? You're the good guy. You, you own the image parser. You can build it from source. So while you build it, you can also instrument it with a compiler pass or something else that we'll see later, uh, in a way that this image parser, while it runs, gives the fuzzer additional feedback about what is happening in the program. And the most prominent kind of feedback that we're usually interested in is coverage. So if the image parser knows that a new if branch has been covered by some input data, that's very interesting feedback for the fuzzer because it knows that this input is special. It triggers a new path in the program. And because the fuzzer has the aim of exploring the program to find bugs, that's exactly lining up with its goal. And if you take this a bit farther, you could also instrument comparisons, and then you could feed some information about these comparisons back to the fuzzer so that it can generate synthetic input data that passes these comparisons. And if you do this, and this is not made up, if you give this feedback of, of like covered branches and values that, that showed up in comparisons, if you feed that back into a modern fuzzing engine, you can start from zero, literally the empty image, and then see how this covers some lines marked in green here. These are just made up, but I mean, that these are not very unrealistic parts of an image parser. Um, and then in the beginning, the image will not be valid. It will just not uh, pass any of these checks and will just return image formats unknown. But then due to these magic bytes and comparison values that are fat back, it will synthesize something that gets closer to a valid JPEG in this case, because uh, it instrumented this check um, where you compare the first two bytes of the file with the magic header for a JPEG, it now generated something that's an empty valid JPEG. And then you keep going and this actually works. I mean, up to this, it works. You can get some like images with some input and then sort of this is a bit made up, but <laughs> in a sense, if you like keep this running for a while, you can get some pretty interesting data synthesized out of nowhere or out of very plain and basic input data. Okay, so that was it for uh, this cute fuzzing demo. Um, simplified, or just like from an abstract point of view, this is something that I really like as a metaphor for what black box versus this modern white box coverage guided fuzzing is like. Um, you essentially view this program under test as a maze that you want to go through. You go in somewhere, but Along the way, along this exploring this maze task, you happen upon bugs. So for example, the classic example is in native code, this doesn't apply to Java necessarily, you have an out of bounds read in an array. And then if you explore enough state of the program, you will happen upon this bug, you will detect it and report it as a finding. And then you keep going because programs are huge and there are lots of like the call graph is usually enormous. So you can explore more and more of the program 
And that works so much better if you know that you just found a new path versus running through this maze with the lights out where you never know whether you actually made progress or not. And like what at the corner where you can go right or where you can go left. And this is information that you can get from, from feedback driven mutations and especially from code coverage feedback. Okay. Um, that's uh, sort of enough about this, these uh, general things about what fuzzing does. Now the question is, what's all the fuzz about? Why do people care? Is fuzzing successful? And the numbers say yes. <laughs> so uh, on the left-hand side, I think these numbers are from, from late 2021. Um, these are the numbers of bugs, many of them security relevant, all of them actionable real bugs that needed to be fixed. And, in the overwhelming majority of cases also were fixed in uh, a number of uh, very prominent projects. So uh, Google has been a very strong proponent of fuzzing for a number of years now. And I think by now they've probably fixed over 30,000 bucks in Google Chrome that were found by a fuzzing. And uh, Microsoft's also pretty big in the fuzzing game. There is a, a special fuzzer for the Linux kernel. And um, then there is this OSS fuzz program that provides fuzzing for open source libraries and that we'll also get back to later in detail. And on the right hand side, you can see some, some interesting uh, highlights of fuzzing. Um, so something that uh, <laughs> well, was the lock for shell of a couple of years ago, Heartbleed, if you remember it. Um, nowadays, that's an elementary exercise in setting up a trivial fuzz target. So like bugs like Heartbleed should never be, or should never remain hidden from now on because we have fuzzing and fuzzing is just so good at finding bugs like this. Um, it also very useful when applied to memory safe languages like Go. So um, in 2020, OSFAS found uh, a critical denial of service attack that could bring down the entire Ethereum network. I don't know whether you care about these things, but if you do, then that's pretty bad. <laughs> and um, as you can see further below, um, fuzzing generally gives you a very sort of good run for the money. So um, if you have 50 days and you find one CVE per day in a dope reader, then uh, the way to go would usually be fuzzing. So this is something that is very relevant. Um, and the question is, how do we apply this to Java? Um, and here sort of the, the, the big names in the, in the fuzzing ecosystem are things like libfuzzle or AFL or hongfuzz, um, AFL++. These are all fuzzers that generally have been applied to languages like C++, where it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot and uh, introduce a security vulnerability. That's different in Java. And for a long time, there haven't been any really, let's say, professional fuzzers. So there have been some, some uh, very interesting um, fuzzing um, or, yeah, fuzzers for, for Java programs with the JVM, um, JQF, Kalinki. But all of them weren't really like state of the art or kept up with the development of the native uh, fuzzing um, ecosystem and community. So what Code Intelligence did in February 2021 was to release something that we've had for a while internally, um, a modern Java fuzzer based on libfuzzer and Jococo for its coverage feedback. And this thing is essentially like two parts. It's a native application that starts a JVM and then a Java agent that attaches to the JVM and does runtime instrumentation. So the good thing about Jezzer is, as opposed to native fuzzing, you can apply this instrumentation to anything in compiled form. So there is no need to do a source code instrumentation. Everything is done by Java agent and bytecode manipulation. So you can just load jars from the internet and start fuzzing them. Um, and as I've alluded to in the intro, um, Jezzer collects dynamic feedback from comparisons it also has a lot of hooks for Java standard library functions. So if you do an, I don't know, array equals or string equals or even regexes, um, Jezzer will find a way to crack these checks and get past them. Um, Jezzer is fully open source. So um, yeah, there's, there's nothing to hide. You can use this. And um, if you have ideas to improve it or just, I mean, contributions or even just rough ideas, if, what you would like to see or have any issues, then drop by our GitHub repository, um, give us a plus one and leave your questions or suggestions for improvements. Um, yeah, and as I said, it's a fuzzer for the JVM. So because it works on the bytecode level, you can fuzz Scala, Clojure, Kotlin from the perspective of Jezzer, it's all the same. Okay, so uh, one more thing probably uh, this was very different one year ago when Jezzer was essentially only available on Linux. 
Um, since then, um, we've ported it to other architectures. Now you can say, okay, wait, isn't this Java? Shouldn't this be easy? Well, um, it's an interesting thing to write a fuzzer. So this thing has a native component. It uses uh, the Java invocation API to start a JVM, and it also uses some inline assembly. So that wasn't entirely trivial. Um, but by now, it's available on Linux, macOS, even M1 Windows. If you just start out and you don't need like the, the optimal performance, uh, I would suggest um, you use the provided Docker images. So there is CI fuzz Jezzer, which is the full Jezzer, and CI fuzz Jezzer Autofuzz that we'll use in a minute. Um, that gives you a very nice intro to fuzzing. And if your build system of choice is Bazel, then there is also the rules fuzzing rule set that you can use for, for first class integration of fuzzing and particular Jezzer uh, into your, your build system pipeline. Um, okay, with that, uh, one more slide about general things. The question is, why do you even want to do this for Java? So what's in it? In C++, whenever there's an out of bounds axis into an array, there's usually someone who's really clever who can turn this into a terrible exploit that gets you to remote code execution or like local privilege escalation or something that's actually very terrible to you. Um, for Java, that's a bit different because I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a managed runtime. It doesn't let you do all these really, really, really terrible things. Um, but depending on how you use it or you use a library, um, there are still lots of things that can go wrong. So there are things that are usually more on the functional bug side, something like an uncaught exception where a function, for example, uh, threw a runtime exception that it didn't declare in its Java docs. And if you're not careful about it, it may crash your server. Admittedly, that doesn't happen often because usually your server is a bit more <laughs> elaborate than just like uh, dying due to random uncaught exceptions. Um, but then there, there are some other cases, like, uh, for example, if you sort of just want to track down bugs, then these things are very important. Um, you can also verify assertions in your program, because if uh, sort of they've run against the fuzzer for a couple of hours and uh, haven't been triggered, then you can be sufficiently sure that, that they will probably not be triggered in production. And you can also compare implementations. So if you write a parser for something and other people have already written parsers for it and you want to ensure that you're compatible, maybe just set up a fuzz test that verifies that the fuzzer can't find a difference between the two. That's something that may also, uh, as we will later see, uh, have security implications. But then there are also things that you really need to catch. I mean, it, it sort of, there's an order to them. Some of them are not as terrible, but uh, if you have an infinite loop in your web service and people submit 1000 requests that each trigger an infinite loop, then your CPU resources will spike and probably your service will go down. And out of memory errors or exact overflow errors can be similar depending on how adventurous you are in catching them. And then there are all these bugs that uh, haunt all languages. Um, you couldn't get remote code execution in Java as uh, for example, we've seen through log4j. And there are also injections into domain specific languages like SQL or expression languages or scripts of any kind, JS engines in Java that, that can still get you to really, really bad critical bugs. And the list continues, like, uh, yeah, your imagination is the boundary to how you can mess up things in programs. And all of these can potentially be fuzzed if you can detect them. More on that later. Um, so now um, let's get it started with a simple example. Um, as I said before, um, fuzzing, I mean, you need some sort of some intuition and some background to sort of get started with it, really. But if you just want to give it a try, um, this is how you would do it. Um, you can use the Jezzer autofuzz Docker image to essentially tell the fuzzer, download this Maven dependency at this version and start testing this function until something breaks. For example, an uncode exception or uh, something that triggers an infinite loop, something extraordinary. And that's it. That's all you need to do to start fuzzing. And this command here, what we're additionally doing is that uh, we are mounting the current working directory into the slash fuzzing directory in the container. Um, if Jezzer finds a crash, it will output a wrap reducer that you can use to, well, wrap reduce this crash outside of Jezzer. And this will land in this uh, working directory. And um, the way you specify a method is just via the, the usual Java method reference syntax. And if there is an ambiguity in um, this function because there, there are overloads, 
Um, you can just paste whatever you find in Javadoc URL. That's the right syntax to um, resolve this ambiguity. And well, I will just show you this in a second. There are not many more things to say about this. It should be very easy to get started with. Um, there are two flags that may be of interest. There's the keep going flag um, with which you can say, well, uh, don't overwhelm me with crashes. Stop after n findings. And then there's autofuzz ignore with which you can specify classes and all exceptions that are subclasses of these classes will be silently dropped. So if you don't care about null pointer exceptions, then put in these things. Um, I'll now switch to my terminal and show you some examples. So let's copy this. Switch to terminal. And I'll just run this. And as I said before, uh, to not overwhelm this, uh, I'll just e add a keep going one. So what we'll do is that we will fuzz a version of JSOUP, which is an HTML parser that um, is known to be vulnerable. So there were a number of issues that we found uh, in it with Jezzer, and they've now been fixed, but we are now using a vulnerable version. And I'll just start this now. Um, what this does is uh, it uses Corsair to just download the jars, and now Jezzer is starting up. It's instrumenting some classes, and it crashes on an all pointer exception. So I'll just briefly go over the output because it's a bit much <laughs> um, to tell you what you're actually looking at. So when Jesus starts up, um, it gives you some information. It loads some um, hooks, as we call them, some things that instrument functions and provide feedback. Um, some interesting things like regex injections, reflective calls that we'll talk about later. All these things are there to detect bugs. And then it goes about instrumenting classes. So it instruments classes for various reasons, to track coverage or to give dynamic feedback. And here you can see that it started instrumenting JSOUP, and that took so and so long. And then the actual fuzzing starts. And well, in this case, it crashed pretty quickly because, well, null is one of the first thing it tries. So what you can see is here it happened upon a crash, upon a null point exception. Not very exciting, I know. And what it did is that it outputted two files. So there is one. There is this. Um, lowercase crash file. That's something that you would also get from the fuzzer. And that's the representation of the raw, let's feed this to FXD, uh, of the raw fuzzer input um, that, essentially binary input, that was fed into the program and converted into a string because a string is what this JSUPSAR uh, parse message takes. That's something that uh, Jezza does for you uh, automatically. Uh, in this case, you can see the file is empty. That's the first thing Jezza tries, and that was enough to, to get a null into it and trigger this very uninteresting crash. Um, but I can also show you um, this other file, and this is specific to Jezza. It's a pure Java reproducer of this vulnerability. Well, vulnerability in this case is just an expected crash. So what you can see here is a file that is a class with a weird name with a hash at the input. And then this is just a main function that calls JSU parse with a null string. As I said, not very exciting, but um, just sort of for uh, introductory purposes, we will give this a try. So what we can do is we can download the jar. Oops, even down. And uh, then use this jar to compile the reproducer just to check that this works. And we, whoops, oh, sorry, wrong file. And we see, okay, that's the null pointer exception. Not very exciting, so now let's go for something more interesting. Um, keep going too. We'll ignore the first finding, we'll go right past it. And now we'll actually see some more fuzzer output. Um, so what the fuzzer does is that it applies random mutations to the input informed by um, feedback from the application. So here you can see that it uh, noticed that the string HTML has some special meaning in the context of the application, so it tried to insert it somewhere, or it decided to insert some repeated bytes, or shuffle some bytes, or insert null bytes, or something that it uh, discovered made sense in the context of the application. And it also dynamically loaded some new classes because some new functionality and some new coverage was triggered. And you can see here, this is a rough a measure that's roughly equivalent to uh, Jacoco's branch coverage. So you can see that it covers more and more branches. 
And these features go up if you trigger a branch multiple times. So for example, it's an interesting difference between triggering the loop once or triggering it 1,224 times. And that's covered by this. And you can also see the memory usage and how many executions per second you have. You should generally aim for something above 1,000 executions per second, but Jezzer has very little overhead. So if your fast target is fast, then Jezzer will also be fast. And you could go, go until the, the six digits on a, on a regular laptop. Um, right, so let's scroll to the end. Uh, looks like Jezzer finished. And it finished with a bug. And uh, this is now a real bug because JSU claims uh, in the Java docs that it never throws any unexpected runtime exceptions. Um, turns out it does. So here you could see a full stack trace um, that would help you debug this. And we can take a look at the user, which now looks a bit more interesting. I mean, it's pretty hard to tell say what this actually does without debugging. Um, but this is something that you can now compile just like we did before to reproduce um, this exception. And the good thing is that uh, you can also minimize it. There is some functionality that allows you to tell the fuzzer, take this particular crash with this particular exception stack trace and try to find the shortest input that causes this crash. And that's something that you would now do as a follow-up to debug this. OK, that was uh, the very extensive first example. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Um, I have one more example because I, I found it kind of interesting. Um, this is also not about a vulnerability, but about interesting behavior. Um, so many of you probably know regular expressions and that they're very useful in matching strings. And it's a very uh, <laughs> not well-kept secret that even short regular expressions can blow up as in consume resources exponential in the length of the regex or the input string while they are matching a string. So for example, if you take this regex down here, um, which is sort of a very bad way to match repetitions of AB, and you apply it to this string that is almost repetitions of AB, but then an A in the end, you will already get a timeout because uh, this does some backtracking and it first tries um, to match the star, but then it backtracks one step at a time and also repeatedly tries to match the plus, and that leads to exponential backtracking. Something that I didn't know before I started um, fuzzing things is an answer to this question. We know that Java compiles regular expressions, as in parses the string and turns it into some internal representation, and that's supposed to be very fast, and it actually is. But can this process of converting it to Java's internal representation can that already consume exponentially unbounded resources? And it turns out, yes. So how would we answer the question with fuzzing? Um, we'll just use the regular Jezzer in this case because we don't need this, this fancy Maven download. Um, we'll just tell it with the autofuzz parameter to fuzz this function with all its overloads. That's the function that turns a string into Java internal representation of a regex. Um, and because we look for breakages, as in like infinite loops or an out of memory error, we'll just ignore ordinary exceptions because those are interesting. And here's a special case, but you may find this useful in other cases. Um, you can use the dash dash instrumentation includes argument to specify essentially a package wildcard or multiple uh, comma separated in order to um, say which classes Jezzer should instrument for coverage. So it will get feedback from maybe more classes than that, but the classes that you're really interested in should be the ones um, that you instrument for coverage, as in additionally with uh, some version of Jacoco. And here, because this is special, we want to fuzz the Java standard library itself, which is usually excluded. Um, we need to explicitly tell it that we want to fuzz Java util regex, everything in there. So we'll again take this command and run it. And I will go to this terminal. And as before, uh, so that we don't overwhelm things, uh, I'll do a keep going one. And then we'll let this run. Starts for a while, instruments some stuff, runs for a bit. And now it hangs. And it hangs pretty long because usually it has like 12,000 executions per second. And now it's taking some time. So we'll see. Um, we'll probably crash in a few seconds. Um, right, there it is. Okay, 
this is something um, where, where Jezzer does some magic on top. So what happened is that this thing threw an out of memory error just from compiling a regex. And uh, what we do is that we wrap um, some interesting findings and also generate other findings and annotate them with uh, a security, well, let's say severity. Um, this would be low because it's just an out of service. It's nothing, nothing major. And it also gives you some information on how to reproduce this because when, when people try to reproduce findings, it's usually that they run this on their beefy M1 and then things don't reproduce because they have more RAM. So this is, this is something that, um, some setting that should allow you to reproduce this finding. So what actually happened? How is this possible? Um, let's take a look at the crash. Well, that is enough. And this is interesting because this shows an overload of compile that additionally specifies some flags. Spoiler, these flags, I think, are necessary to cause this behavior. Without flags, I think uh, compiling regex is pretty safe. And then there's this weird thing that looks like a mixture of multiple Unicode characters. And um, as before, we can, because this has no dependencies, just start this reproducer and see that actually reproduces the crash. Ah, OK. In this case, it didn't, probably because I should specify this. Well, OK. Maybe something was weird. But maybe something else is using more memory. Well, OK. But it, it does crash, and you can easily find examples that, that uh, reliably crash regardless of memory settings. Why is that? Um, you can look at this in a hacks editor. And what's actually happening here is that we are repeating some weird Unicode character over and over again, but it doesn't lead to a new character that is visible here. So this looks like just one display character, but in reality, it's all these Unicode characters stacked over each other. And what's happening here? There is um, a setting that you can supply to this compile function. Um, it's called canonical EQ for canonical equivalence. If you click on it, it is, uh, well, an understatement. It says specifying this flag may impose a performance penalty. Well, it does a bit more than that. What it does is that it essentially scans um, the V Unicode character and decomposes it into its constituents, which uh, can be combining marks that indicate that certain characters should be essentially stacked on top of each other. And then it tries to go over all permutations of these combining marks. So if you look at the relevant source code in pattern.java, you can see this, this scary part where this counts something and then it loops over them, essentially computes n code points factorial, and then allocates a string of that size, string area of that size. And that, of course, blows up immediately if you like, uh, take a number of um, just like, I don't know, like 20 to, or yeah, around about 20 characters should be enough to essentially blow off your app. So yeah, uh, it turns out that maybe this wording should become a bit more stronger. Um, yeah, this uh, has a very hefty performance penalty and you should not enable it if you uh, compile untrusted regexes. Yeah, this was just uh, an interesting find and that shows you how you can explore APIs easily with uh, Jezzer and the autofast feature and just happen upon error cases that maybe even the developer didn't really think about. Um, right. Uh, I should say that sort of in the same way, we, we extensively fast the Java standard library and also found some, some issues, um, that we report to Oracle and that have been fixed in recent critical patch updates, like in the image parser or the parser for, um, certificates and, and all these things that, that can be, uh, subjected to text control data. There are some interesting things there. Um, right. So now, um, you've seen the autofus magic. Autofus can do more. Um, autofus can go as far as sort of constructing complete uh, object hierarchies. So it knows about builders, it knows about interfaces, it will scan the class path, it will sort of try everything to call this method that you specified with very interesting input. Um, but as always, there's a limit to magic and magic has a performance penalty. And since fuzzing is very performance sensitive or very CPU intensive, um, usually if you sort of, if you're grown up and you want to optimize something, then you will build your own fuzz target. What is a fuzz target? It's essentially just a method that the fuzzer calls repeatedly, very often with input, and that should exercise some interesting functionality in a library. Um, and what you need to do to write a fuzz target at the moment is the following. You add a dependency on 
the Jezzer API, which is a very small dependency that essentially just gives you some, some helper functions. And then you create a class with a public static void fuzzer test one input method. And then you can decide either you take in a byte array and you get a raw fuzzer input, because that's what, what fuzzers operate on, just binary data that they mutate. Um, that's, that's very useful for image parsers or something, but generally, for example, JSU wants to fuzz UTF-8 strings or, or UTF-16 strings. And that's not very simple, actually, to efficiently turn random data into valid UTF-8 strings. Um, but we've solved this for you. So there is an extensive API, hence the Jezzer API. And here's some, some snapshot or screenshot from the Java docs um, with a lot of helper methods. So you can define as the single parameter, a fast data provider. It will be provided with an instance of this interface and it will allow you to construct Boolean arrays, pick values, consume remaining as string gives you a long string um, constructed out of the fuzzer input. You can essentially treat it like an instance of random that gives you way more different primitive Java types um, to work with and then to eject into your actual API to subject it to this random data. In the end, you just compile your application, you compile your fast tests. Ideally, you package them as a single deploy jar that just makes it a bit easier, but you can also specify a full class path. And then you run Jezzer like this. Um, as before, you just start the CI first Jezzer uh, um, container. And now it's a bit more important that you, you mount the current working directory because that is the thing that should contain your jars. Then you specify your class path in the same format as you as you're used to. And you specify the target class, which is the class with this other test when input method, and then Jezza goes to work. If you want to do this on Mac and Windows and care about performance, then you can just download or build the um, release binaries and run it on, on bare metal. Right. Um, why would you want to do that? Is there an example where um, autofuzz is not good enough? Yes. So if you want to do some more interesting things, um, you could go into something which I would like to call property-based fuzzing. Um, it's where you don't just watch out for uncode exceptions, but where you actually have some security property that you can essentially codify in an assert and that you want to verify holds even if the input is terrible. And this is my standard example. Um, there's a project uh, in the, the OWASP organization on GitHub, um, the JSON sanitizer. It essentially takes JSON-like content which uh, sort of is a euphemism for arbitrary content, potentially attacker controlled, and converts it to valid JSON. And it makes this additional um, claim that the output will not contain the substrings tag script or some others, and can thus be embedded inside an HTML script element without further encoding. So if you have a server application, then it's supposedly safe to just take the script down here and inject this JSON literally into this script block any minute. No XSS, this is safe. I think now it is safe, but it used not to be safe. And this is one of the first uh, CVEs that, that Jezza found were actual real security issues that go beyond denial of service. And how do we do it? We just wrote this function. That's it. That's the fuzzer test one input that takes a fuzz data provider it turns the raw fuzzer input into a string, feeds it into the JSON sanitizer, and then checks for a closing script tag in the output, which should not be there. Turns out it is. If you insert some backslashes before the script and after the, the closing tag, um, those will be sanitized away, but then what remains is a valid closing script tag. So if you feed this thing in, then, um, well, it will close the script tag and you will get a classic cross-site scripting tag. So this is a CVE that we fixed, and then we found some other things and crashes. And um, now I think uh, we have almost 100% code coverage on JSON Sanitizer, and this thing has run uh, for continuous fuzzing for like a year. So this should be very safe now. But yeah, this is something that Autofuzz can't find because it's not directly related to an exception, but um, it's something where writing a manual fuzz target is very useful. But as I, as I showed, hopefully not too complicated. Um, there is one more example uh, where we got some, some recent YouTube fame. Um, so, well, <laughs> lock for shell. Um, there was the big, 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 terrible bug, but then people started looking and found more issues, as in bypasses of previous fixes, 
And there is one particular example where um, I think this was discovered by, by multiple people independently, but in particular by Anthony Weems on the upper right end um, of the screen, uh, who discovered that in certain special situations, which is satisfied on macOS, okay, not many people run things on macOS, uh, I mean, not web services, but also on Alpine Linux. And there, um, the first um, blockless approach to the JNDI um, issue that we're probably all familiar with um, could be exploited because there was a parsing difference between the Java URL parser, which was used by Log4j to implement the blocklist, and the LDAP JNDI URL parser, which for whatever reason is a completely different thing and has completely different implementations. And actually, Anthony Weems used Jezzer to find this parsing difference with a simple fast target, as you can see here. And if you're interested in this, there is a very nice um, YouTube video by Life Overflow that, that you can watch that tells you more about fuzzing and using fuzzing to find parsing differences and exploit them um, for security vulnerabilities. Uh, right, so let's talk about something where finding the bug takes more time. Um, fuzzing is something where if a library hasn't been fuzzed before, you usually find your bugs within minutes. Uh, that has been true for essentially all things that we started fuzzing. If they have never been fuzzed before, there will be some uncode exception or something like that. Um, but then the interesting stuff that may take more effort to find. Luckily, um, Google uh, founded an initiative where they essentially pay the bill for the CPUs that fuzz your application. All you have to do is integrate your library or some library that you use with their service. So there is OSS fuzz that's been established in 2016. And since March, 2021, you can also fuzz Java with it, thanks to Jezzer. And currently we have 23 Java projects um, onboarded and this number is steeply increasing at the moment. So I think we'll be up to something like 50 um, later this year. Um, and it includes all the like, uh, yeah, libraries that potentially uh, get subjected to tech control data that you can think of, something like JSUB or Jackson or even Zebra Crossing. Um, we found some interesting QR codes that don't behave as expected or like can be decoded in different ways and lead to different URLs and some things. At Protobuf Java, for example, um, so far we've found over 500 bugs with it. Um, of which about 50 have a security impact. Even the ones that don't have a security impact due to the nature of fuzzing, they give very actionable bug reports. It's essentially a stack trace plus a thing that reproduces this issue. So it's very easy for maintainers to just fix them. And for example, Jackson and Zebra Crossing have essentially fixed all the bugs we, we, we found or OSS was found within like one or two days. And we've gotten 13 CVEs for, for actual security critical bugs in release software. The idea of OSS fuzz is that it continually fuzzes at hat. So hopefully it catches bugs before they make it into releases, but because Java fuzzing is more of a recent thing, um, there have been some release things that, that had bugs. The most prominent one that um, this found um, led to uh, a security advisory for Protobuf. Um, and we can only assume that Protobuf has been subjected to some Google internal fuzzing before. But the Java thing um, had a very interesting issue where if you subject it to a relatively small payload, like less than a megabyte, then this can hang for several minutes, not really because it does so much work, but because it creates so many objects that the GC doesn't, I mean, it doesn't cause an out of memory issue, but the GC is like, I don't know, like at 90% uh, of the CPU usage for a couple of minutes. And um, that's something that you can, if there is no authentication, is to sort of clock down uh, protobuf, protobuf services or, or GRPC services. And as you can see from the date, um, this took about six months to be found after this started fuzzing the project. You, you can expect this to be more of a deeper bug. We've also had some things in Apache Commons Compress where in some weird situation, if some header was a multiple, was the, the length of header was a multiple of 512, then something entered an infinite loop and then, well, um, never returned from there. So um, fuzzing is something where you will have long tail findings. And if you can invest um, CPU resources, then it's a very good way to find bugs that, that lie pretty deep, but that others can find and abuse. Um, but then, as we've seen before, okay, you have parsing differences. 
which can be security relevant, but not every library is a sanitizer. Um, you can have the other service things, but as uh, one customer of us said, we just sell this and this stuff. If our service are down for like two days, nobody dies, nothing bad happens. So we, we don't care about this too much. So we want to detect things that go beyond denial of service. And how do we do this? The idea is that fuzzing is something that's already very good at exploring the program and its state space, which is something that static analysis has a pretty hard time doing because, I mean, it doesn't have this dynamic feedback. And Java is pretty dynamic and there's reflection everywhere. And even if there is not, it's very hard for a static analyzer to tell whether a certain if statement can be passed or not. Um, Fuzzers are very good at exploring the code. So if we want to teach them to find vulnerabilities, essentially we only have to teach them to recognize that they happened. And then we let them run and then detect them and we're good. And there's precedent for that. So fuzzing only got very popular in the C++ space because of things like address sanitizer, which essentially is compiler instrumentation for your code that detects memory correctness issues when they happen. So for example, when you actually write out of the bounds of an array, then address sanitizer will stop you. It will print stack trace. It will print a very nice colored memory layout that exactly shows you where you wrote and by how many bytes you were off. And then there's thread sanitizer, which you can even use with a JVM that detects data races in multi-threaded code. So essentially, couldn't we have something like this for Java for the kind of vulnerabilities that are common in Java? Because array out of bounds writes, well, that's just an exception. That's not very interesting. And um, we've worked on that. And that's sort of where, where most of our efforts over the last uh, year have gone into. Um, we've implemented bug detectors for things like unbounded reflective calls, insecurity serialization, um, a number of injections. So expression language injections, LDAP, or some forms of OS command injection. Um, we're also detecting regex injections, which can be security relevant depending on how you use them. And uh, well, JNDI, we'll, we'll see more about this later. Uh, this is a like a difficult and ongoing project because, well, the good thing about Java is not everything is a foot gun. It's not C++, so array indexes are, array accesses are pretty safe. So I'd say there are maybe like a hundred interesting sinks in static analysis terms, like functions that that can potentially result in something bad happening, like creating arbitrary files or executing code um, or subverting access controls. There aren't too many, but still you need to enumerate them. You need to think about how to write good bug detectors for them, how to make the fuzzer more likely to trigger these bugs. Um, so that's an ongoing project that we have with, with Google's uh, OS Estos team, for example, people like Abhishek Arya and Jonathan Matzman, and uh, it's also some um, topic of active research with a couple of universities in Germany that we're collaborating with. But if you have uh, ideas for bug detectors or just like, hey, there is this interesting method that does something, maybe Jezza could detect if it's misused, um, come talk to us or just open an issue on GitHub, um, would be very interesting in hearing about this. Um, and now, <laughs> Uh, I sort of had to do this um, because it's probably the most popular vulnerability since Spectre and that down. Um, lock for shell. And because this sort of is something that, that can easily be misused for marketing purposes, I should put this disclaimer up. Hindsight is 2020. Uh, if you find a vulnerability after it has become public, nobody cares. And that's correct because it's very difficult to find something for the first time and it's not so difficult uh, to reproduce it which I know very well as a mathematician. Um, and I should say that um, after doc for shell happened, um, I of course thought about, okay, hey, could fuzzing have found this? And uh, the answer is at the point where it became public, no, <laughs> Jezza wasn't good enough, but it suffices to improve generic things at Jezza in order to find this bug. I'm not saying we, we, we don't have a Lex log for j we don't do anything specific to find this vulnerability. What we had to do is we had to improve um, our instrumentation for Java maps because log for shell uses some kind of a plugin mechanism that dynamically dispatches through maps, um, which I hope is useful in general. And we also had to come up with a bug detector for JNDI lookups. And
then I should say, um, if you have a really large scale application and your instrumentation filter doesn't include log4j, then this will not be found. Um, this issue can only be reproduced if you, I mean, reliably reproduced if you fast log4j itself. Um, so how would the fast target look like? Well, essentially you just instantiate a log4j fuzzer with a vulnerable version of log4j and then you call log error on data consume remaining a string and then you add a lot of boilerplate to configure log4j to be to log performantly as in don't print to standard out because if you do that 100,000 times per second that messes up your computer. Um, that's essentially it. And if you run this fuzzer, um, I'll spare you the details, but uh, it takes about like four to five minutes. Fuzzing is a random process. It starts with a random seed every time. So this can't, I mean, can be different. <laughs> Mileage may vary. And then it happens upon this interesting um, bug detector for remote JDI lookups. And as you can see down here, the fuzzer input includes a lot of garbage, but then it includes the magic JNDI LDAP with a fake URL that uh, we use for detection purposes. And this sort of dynamically proves that you can contact some URL. Um, I should say all these bug detectors, they don't write exploits for you. So if they figure out that there is some class that they can load that's special, as in like it's a class that's not in the Java standard library and a class that's potentially vulnerable, um, they will report this as a finding. Whether you can actually use this to exploit something, that's a whole different story. And there, there are people who are like great experts at that. And it's very complicated, difficult manual labor to, to figure out whether a certain vulnerability is actually exploitable. Um, but fuzzing has to sort of find a good middle ground. And we think that if the application can be triggered to perform J and I lookups against essentially arbitrary sources, then it's probably vulnerable enough that we should tell you about it. Even if maybe it has some weird filter that later on figures out that, I don't know, uh, it shouldn't load objects from this particular one or something. Um, many people in the Java world like to use block lists instead of allow lists, which, well, uh, is a problem if you want to reliably fast things, but uh, yeah, th that's a different story. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of allow lists, but um, yeah, fuzzing can only go so far. Right, so that's it for for log for shell. Um, I'll briefly tell you something about advanced functionality of Jezzer, in case you ever need it. Um, there is some kind of another magic mode. Um, it's called value profiling. It's an underlying feature of libfuzzer and Jezzer is fully compatible with it. So that's why the flag starts with a single dash. If you use use value profile equals to one, you enable a mode where the fuzzer treats progress through comparisons as additional coverage feedback. So if you have, um, for example, a check where um, some input is converted to base64 and then compared to some other string, that's very hard to get through because if the fuzzer just takes the base64 and embeds it somewhere in the input, that doesn't work because the input is first converted to base64 and then compared. So there is no way to just copy strings and pass this check. With value profiling, the fuzzer will actually count how many bits of the comparison it satisfied and track these as individual like bits of progress in its genetic algorithm. So it will just figure out the correct value bit by bit. So it's very good to run fast targets with value profiling after you've run them some, some time without, because um, you will uncover some more checks or pass some more checks, discover some new code paths that um, the fuzzer just wasn't able to get through before. It's a bit slower, so it's not enabled by default, but um, it's very good to break through um, certain barriers. And then if you use JNI, of course, the problem is well, now all the vulnerabilities that native code may have apply to your Java application. Luckily with Jezzer, you can seamlessly fuzz native libraries because we're based on libfuzzer. That's sort of very easy. It just, it just works because it's the same implementation as, as libfuzzer also uses for fuzzing regular C++ libraries. You just need to compile and link your shared libraries with this flag, and then they will be picked up by the fuzzer and instrumented or the instrumentation that's already in them then will be used. And then uh, last but not least, there is additional Jezzer API um, to provide more feedback. So we have uh, an example that we ship with Jezzer um, where Jezzer finds its way through a literal maze and it needs some help with that. So it needs to be told that the goal is to sort of maximize reaching different points in the maze. 
So you sort of have to tell it that it should track all combinations of X and Y coordinates in the maze as state. And you can do that with this explore state function from your first target. And when you do that, then it will have a very easy time to reach the exit of the maze. And there are also some other functions, guide towards containment, guide towards equality. They essentially do that. They help you guide the fuzzer towards making some values equal. And you can use this to provide additional feedback from your fast target, or if you are so inclined to write custom bug detectors. We also provide um, a hooking um, mechanism. So you can hook into standard library functions or calls to them. And there'll be a blog post up on that soon. But if you have any ideas or just generally any input on, on bug detectors, then um, please talk to us and we can see how we can implement them. Yeah, and uh, with that, I basically just want to end um, with the next steps for Jezzer. Um, we want to extend and add bug detectors. We want to make autofiles more reliable and more performant. Um, but there's also something that uh, we've been eyeing for a while. Um, we want to make fuzzing as simple as unit testing. And for that, People don't use Docker containers from within IntelliJ or Eclipse. Um, people usually also don't run command line utilities that then start JVMs. Uh, what we want is we want to get this right in your IDE. So um, luckily, JUnit 5 has introduced custom test engines, and we're currently evaluating how we can turn Jazzer into a test engine so that you can essentially run fast tests with your unit tests. And this is this is implemented as in like, we, we, we have the JUnit part, but actually, um, making um, native code as in libfuzzer able to run concurrently in multiple tests. That's, that's not an easy goal or an easy task. So we are working on this, but it's technically challenging, but we also think that it's it's gonna be rewarding. Um, yeah, that's uh, the part about Jezzer. If, you, if there's anything interesting, uh, anything you want to know or ask about, or just like think about maybe contributing or just recommending, then please, uh, visit our GitHub repository and let us know. And then um, one more thing, so because I'm, you know, I'm from, from Code Intelligence, and the question is, so what does Jezzer do if you have like more elaborate needs? So um, Jezzer can fuzz libraries pretty well, everything where you can write a fuzzer test when input method that exercises interesting functionality. Um, if you have something more complicated, if you have, for example, a multi-service app, that has a Go service and a Java service, and you want to fuzz that through a REST API, that's something that uh, sort of the commercial offering that encompasses Jezzer, but adds more things and more languages and sort of this whole web service dimension to it. Um, that's something that uh, you can do with a commercial tool, but everything that um, you can do to fuzz libraries will always be and is open source. Um, yeah, and with that, um, thank you. That was the talk. And I think I'll now open it up to questions and summon back Patrick. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Um, I would encourage like all the participants writing their questions into the question and answer part of Big Marker, so we can collect them and then afterwards I will ask the questions to Fabian. And um, just like before starting with the questions from the audience, I have a question which I saw like on your slide, which was like, you didn't talk much about that. It was like the auto fuzzer and the, the regular fuzzer Docker container. So um, what's the difference there? Right, um, they run the same, I can I can go back some slides. Uh, they essentially, they are both Jezzer. Um, oh. So as you can see, we had this uh, example where we essentially just Pass this dash dash autofuzz flag to regular Jezzer and it worked. Um, the autofuzz um, container is essentially a bit of a gimmick. It's a wrapper around Jezzer that does, does nothing more than launch Jezzer with the right arguments and first download this particular Maven dependency and then run Jezzer on the full class path that you get from this Maven dependency for this method. It's something you could also do manually um, with the class path flag and then the autofuzz flag, JSU parse. It's just easier, and we thought that that people would sort of just take their favorite Maven dependency and start fuzzing it very easily. But yeah, Jezzer is the more powerful Docker container. This is if you want to want to do a quick round of fuzzing. Okay, and Jezzer is not just a Java library itself. Is it like a, a C application, or what is it? 
Right, Jezza consists of two parts. So there is something we call the driver, which is a C++ application that uses the Java Invocation API to start up a JVM that it controls. Mm -hmm. But then most of Jezza, and in the future, probably all of Jezza will be in an agent, which is um, which is a Java agent that instruments the code that's running in the JVM and that does all the coverage instrumentation and communicates with the driver. It receives the input and feeds back the feedback because the driver is the thing that, that includes the fuzzer. And the agent itself also loads some um, native libraries for some interesting purposes to work around some JVM bugs, but essentially that's the thing. And in the future, we hope to sort of port almost all functionality in the driver into a native library in Jezza itself, and then Jezza will be able to be started from within an existing JVM. That's what we want to improve to make it easier to use for people who are not used to running command line binaries. And then it also makes sense to like have this thing um, combined with unit tests or like with, with the JUnit test execution engine. Yes, I see. Great. Um, let's go like to the few questions we have already in the question and answer part. And um, Patrick is asking, how often should we fast a project at nightly builds at each commit? So what's your suggestion? It depends. So if you, if you've never fasted before, it makes sense to just like use sub commit and start a couple of fuzzing runs in parallel sort of to, to get the low hanging fruits. And there will be some, I can assure you. Um, after a while, I think the approach by OSS fuzz is pretty good. So if you have the resources, you can run fuzzing continuously, like all the time. And always sort of when you have a new commit, just push that commit and let the fuzzer pick up this commit and work on it. Um, I think this kind of continuous fuzzing is best, but of course it depends sort of on the on the CPU resources you want to spend. Um, I think, and this is something that, that CI integrations make useful and you could build them around Jezo or just use commercial offerings like ours or whatever. Um, it makes sense to sort of fuzz every new commit for a couple of minutes because the idea is that a fuzzer accumulates an interesting corpus of inputs. So whenever the fuzzer finds something that's interesting as in it triggers a new code path, it stores it in a dictionary and a directory with raw input. And you can just, when you have a new commit, you can essentially view this as um, unit test data that the fuzzer synthesized for you. And at least you should run the fuzzer over this input dictionary and let it continue for say two minutes. And that will already catch many regression bugs that you could introduce with new commits. Yeah, I think that's the answer. So would you say, um... I mean, you showed examples that you are fuzzing libraries. Um, can you also fuzz applications? Well, you can. Um, I mean, you always have to define what's your interface. So for Jezzer, we said, okay, I mean, this is most useful for the open source ecosystem where most things are libraries. Um, the interface is a Java method. And with autofuzz, the interface is really any Java method. If you want to fuzz an application, okay, what's its API? It's usually something like REST or gRPC. And then it becomes more difficult because then you need something that mutates REST and then communicates with different web frameworks in Java and gets feedback from those. And then there is Spring in the mix or, um, or a gRPC stack. All of this is possible. And um, sort of the, the, the offerings that, that Code Intelligence has, which you need to buy, um, are things where you can actually instrument multiple web services and fast their protocols and still get feedback from a C++ service, a Go service, or a Java service all combined and get coverage feedback, like live line coverage feedback from these things as you go in a CI/CD pipeline. That, that's sort of a lot of things that you need to build around Jezzer to make that happen. And these are commercial offerings, but this library part is always, always open source. So just to understand it right, you're saying it's possible actually to fast a REST API or GRPC yeah. API. It's essentially, I mean, imagine imagine Burp Suite, but it has inside visibility into your app. Um, okay. So that's essentially our goal. I mean, we haven't reached feature parity with Burp Suite and all the things that Burp Suite does, to be honest, but uh, we have much better visibility into the app. And uh, that allows you to sort of get more deeper bugs also in other languages. I mean, we have similar support for Go and C++ comes for free yeah. with libfuzzer. Okay, cool. I think um, this is my follow-up question I just had was this one from Michael, basically. 
he was also asking like you have small entry points and libraries and now can you do applications so i'll archive that one and um let's go to the next question um michael is asking if you run repeated tests do you on the same target um do you have like the same crashes over and over again basically are you using kind of like the same seed or so or is it always different because you mentioned also before something like when when uh, fussing every commit basically you could get a feeling for the stability of the code you introduced right so um how does it work here right um there is a lot of pseudo randomness in jezzer but we've actually tried very hard and i think so far we've succeeded to make it a deterministic function of a single seed you can supply on the command line um, so if you run regular Jezzer with a fast target and you supply the um, dash seed parameter, you can set this to a number. And if you set this to a fixed number, it should do the same thing. It should do the same mutations, assuming, of course, um, the uh, library under test is deterministic in its input. Um, you should always get the same result. And if you run it on a reproducer, there are no mutations. Of course, then it will always do the same thing. And um, this is not the same with Autofuss because Autofuss does some magic things like use class graph to scan your class path for implementations of a given interface. Um, we've also tried very hard to make that deterministic, but that's much more difficult. Um, so in general, if you have a fixed fast target, you should expect it to be deterministic if you supply a fixed seed. But by default, Jezzer will use a different seed for every run, which makes sense because you want to find new bugs um, usually and the reproducers it emits should be good enough to reproduce things. Great, thanks. And there is another question and that, that's like the last one in the list. So like for the other ones still watching, the last chance actually to add more questions there. So the question from Stefan is, I assume Chazer does not spawn a new JVM for every execution. Is there a strategy to test a stateful component? Worst case, some legacy code where some state is stored in static fields. So how does Jezzer handle that? Right. So um, first of all, yes, of course, uh, Jezzer does not uh, start a new JVM for every execution. Um, so we, we, we start up, so Jezzer is in process. So it sort of runs in the same process as the JVM. It starts up a JVM once and tries to enable all the performance things you can get out of a JVM. Uh, including some more arcane features. So yes, it's a single JVM. And yes, that means fuzzing stateful things is difficult. And now there, there are basically two answers. The first is the cheap one. Fuzzing stateful software is difficult and nothing is going to change that. If you have global state that affects weird things in the long run, that is going to be an issue and fuzzing will not be easy. So um, best answer is try to refactor some code try to mock some things until that's no longer the case. Um, other than that, of course, you can include reset logic in your fast target. I think that's sort of the best general catch-all answer. Um, if you need to reset something, um, reset it in your fuzzer test one input method at the beginning. It will slow down fuzzing a bit, but probably make other things more useful. And because we have deterministic runs, if you run into a finding, um, that doesn't reproduce just with the reproducer because previous executions accumulated some global state that was a prerequisite for this crash or bug, then you can just, because Jezzer emits um, the seed it uses in one of the first log lines, you can reproduce the full run and debug that way. I'm not saying that's very nice because sort of debugging 10,000 executions may be difficult, but these bugs tend to be very hard to debug and at least with Jezza, you will get a sequence of executions that triggers the bug. Um, I just actually watched the chat as well. And Patrick mentioned a project which um, he is, I think, doing. And he's mentioning FastDB unit. So he's like applying um, FastDB. Um, I don't know how you would call that. But please correct me if I'm wrong. But like patterns or like rules. Oh like within um, JUnit, and this is more like executed as a, a static set of um, of rules during during the JUnit execution. 
So have okay, you heard looks of something about really it? interesting? And uh, first thing I'll do after the talk is look into it. No, I, I haven't heard of it, but I guess I should have. Um, I mean, I can't say much about it just from a quick glance, but uh, this sounds very interesting. And um, I mean, essentially, this fast data provider that that I showed in my slides. Um, that's essentially also just sort of a general input source that you can use to essentially generate everything. And Autofuzz also just sort of generates arbitrary parameters. So maybe there are ways to, to integrate it with this or just to, to sort of make it usable as general input data for unit tests that already exists. Um, mm -hmm. These are also avenues that, that we're pursuing with this uh, JUnit integration that we are planning to have. Um, yeah, and this should definitely make it more usable by just like adapting tests and just subjecting them to more interesting input data. I yeah, thanks all, for the recommendation. I'll take a look. I think your approach is anyway very new still, even though like you start, I don't know when you start, but you said like you you um, have open sourced the, the, the Jazzer library um, last year. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's actually like already a great step you, you you did. And now there is obviously some community around this. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, now we have seen those things and we obviously both have, have been talking for a while already now. Um, we have been looking at some possibility to create a workshop from the Java user group with you on the topic. So like, do you have already an idea on, or like some things you could tell us what we would look at when we would do a hands-on workshop um, about fuzzing uh, in Java? Right. So, I mean, the most interesting thing is to write good fuzz targets, to figure out whether they are actually good, to figure out how to make them better and to actually find bugs and interpret them. And I think that's something where if somebody has has a Google slide with like, oh, we found this bucket, this bucket, it was interesting, then that's nice. <laughs> um, but sort of there's a lot of like handwork in, in fuzzing that you don't see that way. And that I would say is very, very exciting to see, at least for a limited amount of time, if you want to spare that time. So in this workshop, we would definitely go over some of these things again in a bit more detail and actually sort of write some fuzz targets with Jezzer and try to find some new bugs in uh, open source software and deal with it, or just like bring your own software and, and we'll, we'll look at some showcases and see what, what we can do there. Yes, I think that would, would um, provide like the best results, I guess, or the best eye-opening results if you bring your own software. So um, we are actually looking forward to do something in autumn, I guess. Um, and since now things are yeah, since it's possible actually to meet and like sit in the same room as we have done already, like a few weeks ago with the Red Hat guys working on very low level um, Quarkus stuff. Now, actually, I thought that's actually a, a good idea to work um, with Jazzer and just get an idea how it works. So um, keep an eye open on the website of the Java user group. We will do an announcement. So you will get an, an email from Ursula when we finalize the dates and so on. And I'm also really looking forward to this event with you, Fabian, and I like well. diving deeper into the topic, because I think now this is very inspirational. People wrote, they enjoyed it a lot and it was eye opening. And now I think we should get our hands dirty and try it out and like understand how we can add that to our build pipeline. And um, thank you very much. Fabian, and as all of our speakers at the Java user group, you will get actually this kind of thing here. So it will be a Swiss <laughs> Army knife. Everyone gets this, and Very yeah. we are going to deliver that to your doorstep, like in the next week or two. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. Um, I will now switch the slides to the ending part of the presentation. Um, I would love to thank our sponsors, as always and also the people behind the whole organization of the event and the support from the technical perspective. And then actually, you know, videos are usually recorded. So if certain things were, let's say, too fast, you can watch that again Sunday, 10 o'clock 
the video will be live. At least Marcus promised to do so, right? <laughs> and obviously, if you have questions and you wouldn't want to get in touch with the Swiss Java user group, and there is a Slack channel, and people are asking more and more questions there and get almost immediately help. So it's just a nice channel to get in touch with each other, right? And the last thing I want to say is you will be forwarded just when we finish here the presentation or when you leave the webinar to the feedback form. And as always, we will provide the feedback back to the speaker, to Fabian. And yeah, that means actually we're done for tonight. So have a great day and thanks a lot. And you will directly be forwarded to the feedback form. And also Fabian, just stay here. You will be also forwarded um, to some other place so we can have a short talk as well. well and thanks everybody. <laughs> thank you. See you soon. Bye.